Okay, so uh, today our mathematician spotlight is Gwen Coogan, one of my best friends. Um, let's see, here's what Gwen looks like now. So uh, she's currently a math teacher at Phillips Exeter Academy. Here she is in her classroom doing her math teacher thing. Um, she was a math major at Smith College, uh, a small liberal arts college, much like Swarthmore. Um, and then she got just a, a job in Boston um, doing something mathematical. But she kept running and she got really fast. And so um, she's an Olympian. She represented the United States in 1992 in Barcelona. Here's a picture from that era um, on the cover of Runner's World. But did you know, by the way, that there's no such thing as a former Olympian? Did you know that? A lot of articles, they say, oh, so-and-so is a former Olympian. It's not a thing. Once an Olympian, always an Olympian. So don't make that mistake, right? Olympian for life. OK. Um, in the ten, so she ran in the 10,000 meters, and she was also on the national team for cross country and the marathon. Um, maybe not, not, I'm not sure about the marathon, but she was, one, she was nationally ranked as a top marathoner at least once, um, and she kept doing math all through that. So she was never just a runner. She was always doing math. She got her PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder um, in number theory and studied elliptic curves. So, and now she uh, teaches math, she coaches running, and she teaches other math teachers how to teach in new ways. So she like travels around the country and holds workshops for teaching people to teach in this like problem-based method that, that I'm teaching some of my other classes in um, also. So I thought I'd also show you what elliptic curves are. So um, here are some elliptic curves. So I've drawn a whole family of them. You can see they're things of the form, I'm not sure if you can see, but elliptic curves, um, I'll write elliptic curves are things um, of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are numbers. Um, and so I've drawn a whole family of them here. I hope that you can see one of them pretty well and the other one's not so well. So here's some different ones. You can see, well, I think one of the cool things about elliptic curves is that they often have two pieces, um, a, an elliptical piece and then this other piece. And then you can see maybe as they go out, the little elliptical part gets bigger. And then eventually there's some point where it goes chip. Um, I like to think of them as level curves of some higher surface. So you have some surface, and you're taking slices of it, and they look like this. And so this part where it jumps boop, is like where there's some saddle point on that surface. So, but, so number, theory, um, pe number theorists studied elliptic curves for a long time. This is one of those things where people studied it because it was pure math and it was cool. But you could have asked, you know, hey, why are you studying elliptic curves? Like even in 1997 or 98 when, when Gwen got her PhD you, doing elliptic curves, you could have asked her, like, who cares about elliptic curves? Like, and she would have said, oh, because they're really neat and they're really beautiful. Um, but what are the applications? Well, I don't know. Um, but now, actually, around that time or a little later, people realize you could use them for cryptography. So you, there's some th way you can use elliptic curves to encrypt things. <coughs> Very cool. Um, this could be you. You could teach math, you could coach, and you could do elliptic curves. Okay. Okay, so we're so close to the end. Um, we get all the cool big theorems at the end, which build up on all the things that we've done before. I was thinking about how to give a summary of the semester, and it's kind of like at the end. Um, and it's kind of like, well, we learned all the skills along the way. And at the end, we're able to do these vector line integrals and curve integrals and now surface integrals, which we used all of our other skills in order to do. So that's kind of cool. Um, so we've been talking about um, Stokes' theorem. which in just in general terms says that the surface integral over some surface of the curl of f you can um, relate that it's equal to with a plus or minus sign getting the sign correct um, the boundary curve integral of the vector field itself so it says if you want to integrate curl of f over the whole surface, what you can do is you can just integrate the vector field itself over the curve. Um, and so this is 
along the same lines as the fundamental theorem of calculus. Curl of f, curl of f is a bunch of derivatives. So this tells you that you can integrate um, the derivative of some function over the region, which in this case the region is the surface. Um, it's the same as integrating uh, the function over the boundary. So that's what, so that's the, the idea, and that's the same as the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that if you have some function and you want to integrate this, like f prime of x, which is little f of x, over this region, this region here, you're trying to integrate that over this region, it's the same as integrating the function over the boundary. So the boundary of an interval is just two points, so you do that, f of b minus f of a. So that's the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's the same idea. Um, and we'll start today talking about Gauss's theorem. Gauss's theorem says that the um, solid volume integral, so the three-dimensional integral, um, of the divergence of f is the same as, as long as the sign is correct, the surface integral over the boundary of f itself. So the idea is you have this um, chunk, this solid chunk of stuff. It's, hard, it's very hard to draw the solid chunk of stuff without drawing its boundary instead. And it's hard to draw its boundary without making it look like you're drawing the chunk. Um, but if you want to integrate over the whole solid of divergence of f, it's the same as integrating f itself just over the surface, as long as you have the correct orientation. So it's um, like this fundamental theorem of calculus here. I'll label this. Fundamental theorem of calculus relates one-dimensional things and zero-dimensional things. Stokes' theorem is two-dimensional things and one-dimensional things, and Gauss's theorem is one-dimensional things, uh, three-dimensional things and two-dimensional things. So, but they're all the same idea that you're integrating the derivative over some region. It's the same as integrating the function itself over its boundary. So, so we'll get into um, Stokes, Gauss's theorem in earnest in a minute, but I, th I thought we'd just do another surface integral and uh, Stokes' theorem first. Yeah, so by the way, um, when you do a possessive on Stokes' theorem, traditionally you just say Stokes' theorem with an imaginary apostrophe, or a silent apostrophe, but when you do Gauss's theorem, you tend to put an extra S. I live with this because my last name also ends with S. If you say Stokes' theorem and Gauss' theorem, it's also okay. Okay, great. Right. Anyway, one thing, yeah, okay. All right, probably enough of that. Okay, so, so for instance, suppose you have some surface, like a piece of a paraboloid. So here's the paraboloid. Um, there we go. Okay, so this is the paraboloid um, z equals x squared plus y squared, where z is less than or equal to 1. So it's a nice paraboloid, our usual favorite one, but we chop it off at z equals 1. And this is our surface s, and let's or orient it outward. Okay, and suppose we want to integrate um, curl of f, curl of f, which is some crazy vector field, y, e to the y to the z to the z, comma, x, y, hmm, I think this should be x, z, cos of uh, z, cos of sine of z, whatever, um, and 2 y, minus y squared, 2 y, z. So if you could change this to be a z, it would be Superb. It doesn't work out as well if it's a y. So x, z, sine of cosine of z. Okay. 
So let's suppose this is the curl of f, and we want to integrate the integral over s of curl of f dot ds for this surface here, this outward-oriented paraboloid. OK. So one question you might ask is, wait a second. You're giving me this thing. You're saying it's curl of f. How do you know that there is such an f whose curl is this? So we will come back to that, and we'll show that at the end. So here's a question. How do you know there is such an f? Later. We'll, we'll talk about it later. Um, and the answer is that some vector field, like this one, is the curl of some other vector field uh, if its divergence is 0. So you can take the divergence of these things and find that they are 0, that the t divergence of the whole thing is 0. Yeah, OK. So let's do this. So we want to integrate this thing. We want to integrate this, so we want to take this double integral. So option one is to just do it. So integrate, take the double integral over s of curl of f dot ds. OK? Um, but it seems like a bit of a mess. So we'd have to parameterize the surface and then integrate this thing over it. So it seems tough. Um, not that we can't do things that are tough, but maybe it shouldn't be our first thing. Maybe we should try something else first. Okay. Um, option two is to use Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem says this thing, this thing you want, the integral over s of curl of f dot ds, well, that's just equal to the integral over the boundary curve of f dot d little s as long as you orient things properly. So let's first figure out what our orientation should be on this boundary curve. So let's see. Um, if we have someone standing here and they're walking, and they have their head in the direction of the normal vector, which in this case is out. Um, this is supposed to be their left arm, the one that's over the surface. So one of these has to be the front the of the face, and the other one should be the back of the head. What do you think? Should the person be working, walking from right to left, or left to right across the front? Right to left? Yeah, right to left. I think so, because if, let's see, if this is the happy face, and this is the back of the head, we're on this side going like this, it seems like the left arm is over the surface. OK, so on the front. So this is oriented going this way. OK, fine, good. So let's do it. So we just want to um, take then the vector line integral over that boundary curve oriented in the way that we just drew of f dot ds. But we don't have f. We only have curl of f. So we would have to figure out f. How? Would we do it? So it seems like f would be pretty hard to find. Again, we could probably do it. But maybe it shouldn't be our first option. But now we're sort of running out of options. Uh, we thought about doing it. We thought about using Stokes' theorem. Um, the last thing is something, or at least the next option, um, is something we talked about the previous time, which is that you can replace the surface with a different surface that has the same boundary curve. So replace f s with um, a different surface um, having the same boundary. So we talked about this uh, the last time a bit, that you can imagine that the surface is like a bubble oriented outward. And you could the vector, line integral, vector surface integral of the curl, or the flux of the curl, is the same no matter how this bubble expands or contracts. In fact, you could even contract it all the way in until it became flat, and then push it out the other way, as long as you kept your vector vectors pointing the same way. So if you pushed it up, the vectors would be pointing in. 
So we could, we could replace this surface S with any other surface. Let's try the flat one. So let's, let's use this surface S1. So let's use um, S1, the flat unit disk, at height z equals 1. OK, but it needs an orientation. What do you think? Should we orient it up or down? Down? Yeah, why down? Yeah, the things that we're pointing out, as you can track this surface, whoosh, they're pointing down. So this thing is oriented down. So oriented down, i.e., it's unit normal vector. We can actually just say what it is, because it's the same everywhere. It's just 0, 0, negative 1. OK, so this is our strategy. Let's see if this works. OK, so the thing that we want, the double integral over s of the curl of f dot ds, that's what we want. Um, by Stokes' theorem, that's the same as this vector line integral over the boundary of f dot ds. Um, we can't find f. Well, maybe we could, but we haven't. Um, but that's the same as the vector surface integral over s1 of, again, curl of f dot ds. So this surface s is our original paraboloid piece. This Part ds is that curve, and then this s1 is that unit disk. So we just transformed it to a different one, um, as long as this has the correct orientation. So let's rewrite this. So this is the vector surface integral over s1 of the curl of f dot ds, which is the same as the curl of f dot unit normal vector uh, d surface integral. And we know what n is, so let's write this out then. This is a double integral of s1 of curl of f, whatever that is, dot n, which is 0, 0, negative 1 ds, because the normal vector is always just pointing directly down in the negative z direction. So let's copy in here the curl of f. Well, the first two components are pretty complicated, but we're dotting them, we're multiplying them with 0 and 0, so I don't care what they are. There's something, comma something, and then the last one is 2yz. So these, they're, they're, I don't care what they are because I'm going to just dot them, multiply them as 0. OK, so this is the double integral over our surface of something times 0 plus something times 0 plus negative 1 times 2yz. So negative 2yz ds. Hey, so much better. Yes, I think we're going to be able to do it. So we could just parameterize it and do it now. Um, but one thing we could notice is that along this surface S1, it's just a flat disk at z equals 1. So z equals 1 on S1. So this is actually just the double integral over S1 of negative 2y ds. OK. So this we can do. So for this, we have two options. One option is you can be sort of clever, and you can think, wait a second. This is a very symmetric thing. In fact, it's symmetric across y equals 0. So this, this s1 is symmetric across y equals 0. And this function, negative 2y, is odd with respect to y. So if you're um, integrating an odd function over a symmetric region that's symmetric with respect to that variable, then it comes out to 0. So in the picture over here, the line y equals 0, let's see, this is the y-axis, so the line y equals 0, it's actually a plane. Um, but through s1, it looks something like this, parallel to the x-axis. And s1 is symmetric with respect to it. So on one side, we get, well, we're integrating negative 2y. So on the, on the positive side, we'll get negative stuff. And on the negative side, we'll get positive stuff. And it will be equal and opposite and cancel out. Every point has a buddy. OK? Um, and if you didn't see that, it's OK. You could just set it up and integrate. Um, you'd, you'd be integrating. So you can set up 
in cylindrical, nope, polar coordinates. So the double integral over S1 of negative 2y ds is the integral from theta equals 0 to 2 pi, the integral from r equals 0 to 1. Negative 2y is negative 2 r sine theta times r dr d theta, because ds is just da. And so then we can split it up. This is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine theta d theta times the integral from 0 to 1 of negative 2 r squared dr. And if we're integrating sine theta over a full period, we get 0. So this is 0 times something, something non-infinite. Non so it's zero. Yeah. So the idea of that was we had this complicated integral that we wanted to do, and we were able to replace the surface to something that was simpler, and then actually do it. And we were lucky that a lot of things canceled out. Um, but then we were able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Questions or ideas? All right, all right. So that is Stokes' theorem, um, which relates a surface integral, surface vector integral to a, it's an integral on its boundary curve. Um, and now we'll talk about uh, Gauss's theorem, which is also called the divergence theorem because it is about divergence. So here's how it goes. Um, you have some, some chunk of stuff, some solid chunk. So it could be like, um, like a rock, like a nice smooth rock that's been sitting in the stream for a long time that is solid inside. So we, the solid region, we usually call the solid region, region is E, and the boundary surface, the, so the boundary of E, we call it S. So the surface is S, and then the stuff inside S is the solid region E. Okay, and then as usual, you imagine that you have some vector field flowing through. So who knows what it looks like? It's doing something. I'm not sure what it's doing, but it's certainly busy, as most vector fields are. OK, so there's our vector field F, flowing all the way through from everywhere, flowing through the stuff. Um, Gauss's theorem says if you want to um, uh, wait, it has some hypotheses here. So if your vector field F has continuous partial derivatives um, throughout the solid region E, which also includes its boundary surface S, um, and S is oriented outward, then if you take the triple integral over the solid interior region E of the divergence of F dV, that's the same, and this is a scalar triple integral, that's the same as the double integral over the surface, which is the boundary of E of F dot d s. Okay, so it relates the scalar triple integral of this sort of derivative function to the vector surface integral over the boundary. Um, and the way to think about this, I think, is, well, okay, suppose you want to know this measures how stuff is flowing out of the surface. So you imagine the, the nor little normal vectors at every point of S are pointing out, normal to the surface. So that's what they're doing. They're all pointing out, okay? And you want to know, this right-hand side says, how much is stuff flowing out of your surface? Very reasonable question. And this left-hand side says, well, what you can do is at every single point on the inside, measure the divergence. So you may recall the divergence if you have some point and you have stuff coming out like that, then the divergence at that point is greater than zero. And if you have stuff going in, then the divergence at that point is less than zero. And if you have stuff just flowing by, the divergence is equal to zero and so on. If you have a little bit coming in and a lot going out, divergence is positive, net divergence. So I'd like to think of it as like, it kind of, at the points inside, it all kind of cancels out. 
and or and what well it does whatever it cares about on the inside but if you add all those up <laughs> yeah if you add all those up you only get what's happening on the outside the sum of all the little divergences inside just tells you what's going on in the outside yeah yeah so again it's another um, generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus that you can integrate derivatives on some region. It's the same as integrating the original function on the boundary. Yeah? This is solid. <laughs> I didn't have to move partial derivatives. I could just mean it had like a classic, right? So it's the, it's the vector field that has to have continuous partial derivatives. But yeah, if your solid had a cusp, that's true. It would be, mm, it would be tough to know what the normal, okay, it would be tough to know what the normal vector is right at the cusp. But I think since a cusp um, has no area, that it wouldn't be a problem because whatever problem you had wouldn't contribute much at all to the integral. So it, the, the problem areas would be on a set of measure zero, and so I don't think it would be a problem. Yeah, but if your vector field does something bad, then you have a problem. Yeah, yeah. good question. Other questions? Okay, okay, so let's try it. So suppose that you want to integrate um, some vector field over a tin can. So you have this tin can. Here it is, x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. It's a tin can of height three. It goes from z equals zero to z equals three and radius one, so it starts here at the point X. And suppose you want to know, because you're, you're thinking about eating these beans, you want to know how much harmful radiation has penetrated into the can. So you want to know how much this vector field, which we're about to write down, has penetrated in. So we will um, give this uh, inward normal, our surface S, we'll give it inward normal. And if our answer comes out positive, it means that stuff has gotten into the food and we should not eat the food. So there's our surface S oriented in and our vector field shall be, okay, so we want to compute the double integral over the surface of y to the 1, 2, 3, um, e to the sine of yz, comma, y minus x to the z to the x, comma, z squared minus z dot ds. Okay, so the, our, this is our surface. That seems like fun. We could just do it. But let's try applying um, Gauss's theorem. So Gauss's theorem, let's see if we can apply can we, Gauss's theorem. So can we apply Gauss's theorem? So that we need to check that f has continuous partial derivatives. f. So we're calling this thing f, this vector field. And it looks like it's continuous everywhere, actually, because it's a product and difference of continuous functions. So f is continuous everywhere, and therefore, in particular, on e, s and its interior, e. And we also have to check, so that was the first thing, continuous partial derivatives, yes. And s is oriented out. No, it is not. It is oriented in. But no problem, just change sign. OK, so we can do that. So now, by Gauss's theorem, since we can apply it basically, we have that the double integral of s of f dot ds is the triple integral over the region inside. So this region in here, let's call it e, um, of the divergence of f dv. Okay, that's what it's supposed to be. So that's the triple integral over e. Now we have to find the divergence of this thing. It may have been a while since we computed divergences, but it's partial derivative of the first thing with respect to x, comma, or plus partial derivative of the second thing with respect to y, plus partial of the third thing with respect to z. So let's do it. Partial of the first thing with respect to x. Zero, there's no x's in it at all. Plus partial of the second thing with respect to y. 1 plus partial of the last thing with respect to z. 
2z minus 1, and the integral of that whole thing dv. Okay? Now the 1s cancel out. Okay? And we get the triple integral over e of 2z dv. Okay, and I forgot to change the sign. We were supposed to change the sign. So all the way through, we need a negative sign on the front so that it will be like if it were oriented outward. Okay, so what do you think? This integral, let's say with the negative sign, should it come out positive or negative? Negative, you say? Yeah, why? Yeah, if you're integrating a positive number over a positive region, so z within our region, z is always positive. It starts at zero and it goes up to three. So that should, this integral itself should come out positive, and then we stuck a negative sign on the front. So we expect it to be negative. Okay, so now we just have to do this. So let's do it. So let's integrate in um, cylindrical coordinates. So the integral from theta equals zero to two pi of the integral from r equals zero to one of the integral from z equals 0 to 3 of 2z dv. And dv in cylindrical coordinates is r dz dr d theta. So let's just do that. That's the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta times the integral from 0 to 1 of r dr times the integral from 0 to 3 of 2z dz. Okay, so the first part is 2 pi, the second part is r squared over 2 from 0 to 1, which is a half, and the last part is z squared from 0 to 3, which is 9, so it comes out to 9 pi. And then if what we wanted here was the negative of the integral, so we'll get that this is negative 9 pi. So we, can, so we wanted to know, we oriented our surface in to see if our harmful radiation was getting into our can of beans, but it turns out that things are actually going out. So it's all good, don't worry. You can eat them. Yeah, yeah questions or ideas? So we were able to turn this vector surface integral that we were interested in, this one, um, into just a scalar triple integral. Yeah. All right. So it really brings together, you could think of this as like, this is why we learned to do triple integrals and set them up. So that when we wanted to do this, we could just say, oh, get to this point, have to do triple integral. I got this. Done. Okay, so there are a couple of things we can, um, some cool things we can deduce from Gauss's theorem. Er, yeah. Yep. So one thing is that um, the vector surface integral of a curl vector field over a closed surface is always zero. So the flux, the vector surface integral is often called the flux. So the flux of a curl vector field over a closed surface is always zero. Okay, we can prove this using Gauss's theorem. So by Gauss's theorem, Um, if you're trying to find the double integral over some surface of the curl of f dot ds, okay, so you have some vector field that comes from the curl of something. Well, by Gauss's theorem, if this now, now this thing, this is like the f in Gauss's theorem. It's like, like f. So we have to, um, do the triple integral over the region enclosed by e uh, of, by s, which we'll call e, of the divergence of whatever that thing was. So the divergence of the curl of f dv, because this is like 
This is like the F in the theorem. So the vector field that comes from the curl is like the F in the theorem. And a couple of weeks ago, we, we did some calculations of the divergence of a curl vector field, and we found that it's always zero by Clairaut's theorem. So this is the double integral, the triple integral over E of zero dV, which is zero. Um, and I should mention this depends on the orientation. So, so Gauss's theorem only works if S is oriented out. So if F wasn't oriented out, this would be negative. So this is plus or minus. And then this one is also plus or minus, but the integral comes out to zero. So it's always zero. Um, in fact, I thought about mentioning this the other day because we were talking about um, Stokes' theorem. And you can also prove this with Stokes' theorem. So by Stokes' theorem. But you have to think about the empty sets. You have to think about integrating a function over an empty region. And I wasn't sure how you would feel about that. But since we have this other proof, I feel justified in telling you about it. So by Stokes' theorem, Stokes' theorem just says um, that the double integral over S of the curl of F dot D surface integral vector field is the same as the integral over the boundary of S of F dot D S. Again, up to orientation, this could be plus or minus. So, but in this case, we're thinking about a closed surface. A closed surface is a surface that has no boundary. So closed means like the surface comes around and, and closes up, like a sphere, for example, is closed. Or a cube, the surface of a cube is closed. But a hat, so like the paraboloid that we've drawn here, it isn't closed because it has this boundary curve. So um, Stokes' theorem talks about things with boundary. Gauss's theorem talks about surfaces without boundary. OK, so by Stokes' theorem, the double integral of this curl is related to the boundary, but the boundary is empty. If this is a closed surface, it has no boundary. So S is closed. So the boundary of S is empty. So this has to be 0. Um, it's kind of like integrating the function f of x squared over the interval from 1 to 1. That isn't actually empty. That's a single point but from nothing to nothing. Integrate the function x squared over nothing. You get 0. It's the same idea. We're integrating over no boundary at all. Yeah. OK. Um, oh, yeah. So when I, was, when I learned these um, theorems for the first time, I was like, OK, I want to know what's, I want to figure out what the, exam, what the question is going to be on the final exam. So I sat there thinking like, it's going to be something that relates Gauss's theorem and Stokes' theorem, because they're like these big theorems. And we didn't talk about how they're related to each other. So that's going to be what's on the final. We're going to have to put them together somehow. There's going to be a problem where we're going to have to use both. But the thing is, like, it's hard to put them together. It's, so I always wanted to go from this triple integral here to this double integral, and then from this double integral to this single integral, and relate them somehow. Because, I mean, they're the same thing. This divergence of curl goes to curl, goes to the curl, goes to f. Um, but any time you, you drop down both of these dimensions using both of the theorems, you're, uh, you're doing it over the boundary of something that has no boundary. So it comes out to 0. Um, and this is part of a bigger um, result, which is that any time you have a region, so your region could be some solid chunk, like a rock, right? then you consider the boundary of that rock. That's the surface of the rock. Now consider the boundary of that boundary surface. Well, it doesn't have any boundary because it's a closed surface itself. And so that's empty. And this is the case whether we could also think about E as like a two-dimensional thing. Suppose you have mm, like some spilled milk is your E. The boundary of your spilled milk is the curl of the curve around the spilled milk. And the boundary of that curve would be its endpoints. But it doesn't have endpoints. It's a closed curve. So its boundary is also empty. So this is a general thing. And that's why you can't really put them both together. Because when you do, you get something just empty. 
Um, and for the last thing, let's talk about when you know that the curl, that, that some vector field arises as a curl of some other vector field. So this question that we wanted from the beginning. And here's the answer. So the answer is um, um, a given vector field is the curl of some other field if its divergence is 0. OK, so let's try it on this. We, I claimed, or we assumed, that the curl of f was this. And you would think, in order to confirm that this is the curl of something, you'd have to find that f, write it down, take its curl, and so that you get this. But this result says you don't have to do that. All you have to do is take its divergence. So let's check. What is the divergence of this alleged curl? So this thing is y e to the y to the z to the z, comma x z sine of cos z minus y squared, comma 2y z. That's the vector field. And we want to take its divergence. So we have to take the partial derivative of the first thing with respect to x, plus the partial derivative of the middle thing with respect to y, plus partial of the last thing with respect to z. So let's do it. Partial of the first thing with respect to x, 0. Partial of the middle thing with respect to y, 2y. This, by the way, this on the sheet, um, this is a y, but it should really be a z. Because otherwise, as you can see, when you take the partial derivative with respect to y, it'll be complicated. So this is a z. OK, plus the partial derivative with respect to z of this last thing, 2y. And this is a minus. Whew, phew. So it cancels out. And these are 0. This is 0. So um, such an f exists. Such an f, meaning such an f so that the curl of f is, is this vector field. Yeah. F to, then f would not exist. Yep. So I guess this should be f and only f. Good, good call. Yeah. <coughs> so let's try a different one. So um, it's on your sheet, and I'll write it down. So check. So f discover if there's a field G such that its curl is y to the 199, dot, dot, dot. So I'll write it down, and you do it. OK, so how about the divergence? How about the derivative of the first part with respect to x? 0 plus the derivative of the second part with respect to y? 0 plus the derivative of the last part with respect to z? 3z squared x. That's not 0. I mean, there are some places where it's 0, but it's not 0 everywhere. It's not identically 0. So. There is no such G. So sad. Okay. Um, so, so I think there's a problem on your homework where you have to use a field and see it as the curl of something else on your web work. Um, and so anyway, you would hope that the divergence of that thing comes out to zero. Yeah. All right. Thank you.